All right, let's see. Welcome back to the Real Teacher Talk podcast with Mr. Nunez, a podcast about education, teachers, and students. Today we have a very special guest. We have a former U.S. Olympian and professional cyclist by the name of Antonio Tony Cruz. Welcome to our campus, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Nunez. Uh, first of all, just to give you a little background on what we do here. Um, well, we, we have a little podcast that we share with our, our staff and students. And uh, the point was to try to get students involved in, you know, production and stuff like that. And what I started to do is ask que questions uh, from students, particularly uh, about our guests. So, for example, we're going to start with the, the easy ones. Where did you grow up? I grew up here locally. In, uh, I was born in East L.A. General Hospital. And then, uh, let's see, my family moved around a bit. You know, my, my parents worked hard and were always trying to, uh, you know, do a better job in providing for us, you know, me and my two sisters and the rest of our family. So we went from Boyle Heights, moved up to Huntington Park. Yay. Um, yeah, so close by here. And then Southgate and eventually ended up in the city of Whittier. Okay. And uh, stayed local, right? Yeah, definitely local, and always rode my bike through, especially the communities that I grew up in. It's just that's awesome, something man. special about it. So, as far as your family, where are they originally from? My parents are originally from Mexico, and um, you know, I've got aunts and uncles uh, from Mexico as well, cousins, um, and then a lot of you know, us first generation over here, uh, you know, raised in the U.S. that. I don't know. It's interesting. It's a nice mix because I haven't spent a lot of time in Mexico. I'm actually going to be heading over um, for a, a family vacation soon, and I'm excited about it. I've I've pretty much been all over the world, but haven't spent a lot of time, time in Mexico. In Mexico. So wow. What part ex exactly? Uh, my dad is from uh, Ciudad Juarez, and my mom is um, from Baja, from Ensenada. My my uncle or my uncle, my grandfather was a farmer. Okay. Down there, so down there. I always like asking that question because I'm pretty sure, right? It's it's real easy to, you know, have family from that area. Like for example, I have family from Juarez, right? Durango. Mm -hmm. The minute you start connecting the dots, we're all turn out. We're all related. So that's <laughs> that's, that's right. the fun part about uh, finding out where you're from, right? Yeah, definitely. But that's cool. So um, kids also wanted to know what was your life like as a kid, like uh, maybe early elementary, um, you know, up to middle and then high school. Yeah, early on, sports was always a focus with my dad. Um, and my mom was always a really hard worker. Not that my dad wasn't, but she was. She had more of an entrepreneurial sp uh, type of spirit. She mm -hmm. always wanted to have her own business, a lot like my grandfather, her dad was. And my dad was, uh, you know, 20 years in the military. So in the military, you have to be fit, you have to be disciplined, um, you have to be punctual, um, and you know, you have to be able to follow orders and directions to the T in order to be successful. Um, and I think I learned a lot of, you know, from the two of them, just having that, that drive and spirit to go after something, even though you're not quite sure what it's going to be. And then the discipline around that to be able to follow through. So as a kid, you know, those are sort of the, the things that I would say, you know, I took from my parents and sports again, was always on television, was always talked about you know, whether it was with friends or with my parents, but especially with my dad, um, we were always, you know, out doing stuff together, um, sports. So related. he was active and I'm assuming, okay, so you pretty much had a, uh, a military dad and just thinking about all dads, all Latino dads, right? They're kind of, you know, strict to, to begin with. Yeah. So then you had a dad who was a military dad. So. Um, could I ask if he was maybe like your hero or someone you looked up to? Because some of that had to have rubbed off, right? And if you could talk about other heroes as well. Yeah, he was definitely um, a hero and inspiration for me growing up because he got into cycling um, by necessity. We, I think, only had one car for a while. He bought a bike, had to ride his bike from Southgate. I think he was working in Long Beach at McDonnell Douglas at the time. And, you know, he had to commute by Travel bike to back work. back and forth, huh? Yeah. And, you know, of course, he was already, you know, pretty fit just from all the um, the different types of sports that he played. Um, and so, you know, he 
enjoyed riding the bike more and more. Found out, I believe, there was a club there mm. and became part of that club. They invited him to, on some rides, you know, um, like centuries, things like that. And it things just kind of, in terms of cycling, organically grew from there for him. And when he got his first, like, nice road bike, mm -hmm. I just remember, like, man, I can't wait till one day when I have one of these to ride and I can go as fast as my dad. So definitely looked up to him. That's awesome. Yeah, most parents, I mean, they do that even today. I think most of our, our community has to find a way to get around. Um, and now you have, you know, buses that carry bicycles now, um, you know, which back then, that's probably one of the reasons why your dad had to go back and forth on a bike, right? Because they didn't have those routes with the nice bike rack on front of the bus, right? They didn't have any of that. As a matter of fact, if you saw the bus or heard the bus, you just want, and you were on the bike, you needed to get out of the way. <laughs> That's all things are scary. Huh? It was a, it was a different time, you know, especially when my dad was commuting. And I think too, like for many years, it seemed, even when I started riding, cyclists were viewed more as second class citizens, maybe people, people who couldn't afford oh. to drive a car. And so, there were some negative um, sort of stigmas that were associated with cycling that, you know, I just didn't really understand because, and I didn't learn until later in life, I just had such a passion for being out on my bike. Um, and I didn't need to have the nicest bike or the nicest equipment because with sports, you know, you do the talking with, you know, for cycling with your legs. I don't, you don't have to always have the best gear, but if you can outperform people, you know, that really shows the quality of the athlete and the character. Um, and so, you know, I would have friends that would not understand or even some, sometimes make fun of me, especially once I got to high school. Like, why do you ride a bike? Like, we all have cars. Like, why don't you get a car? Well, little did they know, my bike was probably, you know, at that point, twice the price of what their cars cost. Right. But it just, you know, it, it, it kind of dawned on me later on, like, huh, I kind of am a... A sec viewed as a second class citizen but I just stuck with it because I had a passion for it there it is so I have some students from my homeroom class that I have uh, some questions for you I have lovely Grajeda who would like to know what are the things you like to do besides writing I would say the thing I like or enjoy most besides bike riding is just being with my family spending time with my family um, I have, I've always had a lot of family support, um, especially, you know, family coming out to all my sporting events. Um, when I went to the Olympics, we actually, you know, I, I wanted to take as many family members as I could. All my tias and tios and primas that would come out to the races, you know, on really hot days, on rainy days and support. So we had a fundraiser and I think we ended up taking about 20 family members, you know, tickets to Sydney, Australia. Um, housing um, and then the Olympic Committee also provided some uh, like free tickets for the family to be able to watch you know soccer games wrestling Ooh. a lot of the different venues so for me you know that was that was sort of my my payback to a lot of my family for supporting for you, supporting huh? so All family for me uh, first and foremost you know when I'm off the bike that's the most important that's cool Somehow I picture you riding with them. <laughs> Somehow you drag them some out there them. on the, some of them. I figured that, right? It's like, right? Yeah. They just can't help it. That that rides the right bike, so why not, right? Yeah. So I have uh, London Saldana. I was a little sixth grader. Uh, how old were you when you first began competing? I think I was about 13. And the way I got into my first race was my dad had just started competing maybe I think he'd been racing for about two years and there was a pretty strong um, racing calendar in Southern California that I, I wasn't aware, you know, mm -hmm. I knew where to go, you know, play or compete in baseball or football or soccer at the time, but cycling was just so new to me. And then once I learned about this calendar, I wanted to go and see what my dad was up to, you know, check out these races. And the one, I think it was the second race that I went to, there was what they called a, an open category and you could you didn't have to have a racing license because there's a governing body for cycling just like all the major sports and in order to compete in sanctioned events you have to have a license a license for these events so this was kind of the way for the organ the uh, governing body to get youths especially into the sport of cycling 
And, and how'd you do that day? I, or when you when you started? How'd I you do? borrowed my dad's bike. He had to lower the seat all the way down. I could barely reach the pedals. How old? I was, I think, almost 13, maybe, yeah. Like okay. In my, I was like probably 12, going on 13. And I ended up winning. And I told my dad, like, okay, I want, I want to do more of this. Mm -hmm. This, for me, is, is cool. I like this. That's awesome. Yeah. So aside from that, I think you already mentioned it. What other sports did you say you participate in, especially in high school? You said you did other sports as well before cycling? So I started out as a runner because it was basically, you know, the only thing we could afford uh, at the time as a family that we could do together. Um, so my dad and I would run, you know, we started out probably with like two or three miles and worked our way up to 15 to 18 mile uh, long runs that we would do um, at least a few times a week. And it really created a solid foundation for me in terms of endurance sports. Um, and it really helped me transition into other types of endurance sports, such as cycling. Mm -hmm. And then also tennis. Um, my dad is a huge fan of tennis, which, of course, you know, I wanted to do everything he did. So once he started playing tennis and cycling, I wanted to do both. And I remember when we moved to Huntington Park, we lived right across from, I think it's Salt Lake Park, and they had tennis courts. I'm sure they're still there. Mm -hmm, they are. We would go out and play every day, every day, especially on the weekend. Like, we lived at the courts, and I would get these hand-me-down rackets with, you know, a big hole in the strings, but I didn't <laughs> care. I just I wanted to be out there. And let me ask, did you get to the point, at what age did you, like, start beating your dad, like, either in racing or in tennis? And you just realized, like, oh, wait a minute. Yes. All right? So, Like, it, at one point, you had to have gotten to a point where you surpassed your dad, right? Yeah, definitely. So that happened when I was 14. Mm. Um, and I think at that time, we were living in Whittier, and we kind of had this this route that we would do, and it would finish on a steep little hill where that we'd sprint from the bottom to the top and I would just keep getting closer and closer and closer to him, you know, when we'd do this route probably two or three times a week. And then I just knew, you know, this one day, like, I'm going to beat him, uh -huh. but I'm not just going to beat him. I'm going to beat him good. Oh, <laughs> and I'm going to say, be, I don't know your dad, but being a military, uh, military man i'm pretty sure he wasn't trying to like you know let you win right he oh, wasn't no. giving up easily i'm sure no my dad's not the type of person that will cut you any slack like you have mm -hmm. to earn you have everything to earn it. yeah and especially on the bike if it's something that he's passionate about like if you're even going to be you know part of what he's doing like you have to take it serious and you have to earn it. Mm. And that day I earned it and I, I really never looked back after that. I could feel like I could feel him being like a sense of pride and at the same time like, man, he beat me, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, so after that it was game on. Like I started pushing the pace. I started asking to do longer rides. We started doing rides in, up in the San Gabriel Mountains because I knew I was a better climber. So any way I could, you know, really just get out there and thrash them uh -huh. i would always try and, and go that route and that's so cool about southern california right we're right by the mountains we've got a lot of hills yep a lot of riverbed uh trails and stuff like that yeah right? there's there's tons of opportunity to ride people don't realize even within you know the inner city there are, there are routes you can put together it just takes some time to get out and explore take some notes and then you can you can piece routes together um, from one city to the next mm -hmm. or from your city to the mountains or to the beach. It just takes some time. You know, you got to build up your fitness. You definitely want to build up your awareness um, when you're riding out on the street. One of the things that I do every time I get out on my bike is I never assume that someone is going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. That means someone walking their dog, um, someone riding their, another person riding their bike, especially a driver because I know that I'm one of the most vulnerable people every time I'm out on the road and anything that's going to come across my path or I'm going to have a conflict with chances are I'm going to get you know the short end of the stick so when I'm out on my bike I take it serious my head's on a swivel all the time mm -hmm. but I do ride at like 25 30 miles an hour so man you gotta you gotta be heads up all the time if you're going to ride that fast in traffic Wow. So yeah. I actually have a student, Kyle Garcia, from our homeroom, to ask, have you ever fallen or and what was your biggest spill if you had any? Man, I've, I've 
we got so many scars from so many crashes and you know it was one of those things it got to the point where i had a really bad season in terms of the number of crashes so i had it's pretty it's pretty often that riders fall then huh it's, it's more common. so in the in the competitions oh that's right and you know in training it's not as common i've had a few spills but you know it was mainly once i got to uh into the competition so by the time i was 14 i was fifth in the nation okay yeah, as as still you know, just a kid, uh -huh. and I realized like okay, this I've got potential for this, and I want to compete more and more, and I was always pushing myself, and sometimes you know I would take some risks that didn't end up well for me, and I've got the scars to show it. Mm -hmm. But the worst crash I've ever had was I was in a 21 day stage race they call them, so every day is a different stage, so you have 21 stages. And these events are called Grand Tours, and there's three of them. There's the Tour de France, the Giro de Italia, and the Volta de España, and then they're all tours. And I was doing Volta de España, and it was day two of a 21-day race, and I was everything is based on time. So whoever can do all 21 stages in the least amount of time is your overall winner. Mm -hmm. Well, I was seven seconds out of, they give a leader's jersey for whoever has the least amount of time. And that day I thought, you know what? It's time. I, I want to wear a leader's jersey in a grand tour. Went up this mountain, lost pace with the group that I was with, and, and we had already, you know, gained a huge advantage over the main field or peloton. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to pace myself, get over this top of the climb just behind these guys, catch them on the descent. And then sprinting is one of my strengths, and I knew I could out-sprint this whole group. Well, I ended up crashing in the very last turn at about 60 miles an hour. And crashing, you know, you don't have pads. You have a helmet. Right. But the rest of it is just like your skin, cycling gear, and oh. yeah, skin. And I slid. I remember sliding. I remember sliding for so long that I had to shift my weight because it was. I just needed new skin because it was just, just burning a, so bad. Yeah. And then I hit the guardrail, um, bumped off or flew off the guardrail, and then my bike came and fl was doing like cartwheels in the air. That came and. Uh, one of the gears, the chain rings where the chain sits on, came mm -hmm. and cut my knee open. And, mm. and then I'm just laying there in the middle of the road. And so there's no one coming for about five, ten seconds. But in racing, you have a caravan of cars that are your support vehicles. Mm -hmm. So these guys are flying down the mountain trying to catch up to us. And they come around this turn. Do they see you? And or? they saw me at the oh, very okay. last second. So I went from crashing, you know, and uh, getting really banged up to thinking, you know, shoot, now I'm going to get run over. So mm -hmm. I'm like trying to roll out of the way. I get to the guardrail that I hit and I turn around and it's like a 400 foot drop. <laughs> and I thought, man, this is just, <laughs> it's getting worse. <laughs> yeah, definitely my worst crash, but I went for it. You know, I, I really wanted to wear a leader's Jersey and, um, I time, the reason I crashed was because I pushed it too much. Right. I needed to, uh, take off a little bit of speed before entering that turn that last turn mm -hmm. but i was just so hungry for the victory that I, I took a chance and that was the wrong one to take yeah <laughs> you learned from that one i'm pretty sure right yeah so i have uh, uh magali guzman and would like to know what has been your biggest accomplishment in racing i would say my biggest biggest accomplishment i it's not so much the victories. Like, I've been national champion. Mm -hmm. I've won Olympic trials. One of the most memorable things was competing for the, uh, the U.S., your country, yeah. and representing them um, on the Olympic team. There's nothing uh, – there, it's really hard to, to beat that. But I did stop racing for about six years. So when I was a kid, I, I probably pushed myself a little bit too hard. And then – what happens when you do that and you overtrain your results don't end up you know being what you're you're hoping they would be because you're tired mm -hmm. um, you do need to focus just as hard on your recovery as you do on your workouts mm -hmm. and uh, your racing so I think I just pushed myself too hard I didn't get the results I wanted so I just remember coming home one day and I put my bike away and I told my dad you know I I'm done with the sport I don't want to do this anymore so that was your first retirement, would you say that? Yes, Is that when definitely. you first retired? And I think I was, I had just turned 19. That young, and really? I, I was already picturing you're like your late 20s maybe. So at 19, you decided to give up cycling. Yeah. Interesting. And wanted to wow. hang out with, uh, you know, 
friends and just do different things. I mean, because when you're an athlete and you're really focused on your sport, you, uh, you know, it, it becomes your life. So you do miss out on a lot. Uh huh. So you know, you, there's you gain a lot from the sport, but you also miss out on you know with friends and things like that. So I told my dad I want to focus on hanging out with my friends, and then started a family. Went to, well, yeah, went to school, and then got a job. And it wasn't until like I think my second year, I used to be a pharmacy technician, and I was going to go on to be a pharmacist mm -hmm. because I, at that point I was done with cycling. And then I remember at work one day just saying. Man, I think I enjoyed cycling and that lifestyle and competing like more. And it just so happened that week, a friend of mine, we were living in, in Nevada at the time, came to visit. He was in town for an event, a cycling event. And he kept telling me, because we were doing some riding, he was stayed with us for a week. And he's like, dude, I think you still got it. Like, you should really consider coming back to the sport. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't race anymore. I'm not a bike racer. That's your thing. Mm -hmm. I went to go watch the race. And all I did was yell at him everything that he was doing wrong. And it's a special race for me. It's called Nevada City. Um, and I had finished second there before. I'd never won it. But if you look at the list of winners, it's all the best Americans in the sport of cycling. From Lance Armstrong all the way down, going all the way back to, I think it's the early 50s. Wow. And I was trying to get my name on that list and, you know, as a past winner, and I didn't and that do was, it. Well, that was the spark then, I'm assuming, that got you back into it. And yeah. Figured. And the, it was an awkward drive home, too, because, you know, I drove my friend there and he ended up not finishing the race. He was mad because I was yelling at him. <laughs> and on the drive home, <laughs> we were both quiet and, you know, I had to apologize. And he's like, just start competing. And that was it. I started training hard the next day. Okay. And I would have to get up. You know, sometimes at 4.30 in the morning before work to try and get three hours of riding in to go climb some mountain in the dark. Um, and then, you know, maybe take a nap on my lunch break and eat real quick, take a nap, and then ride again or go to the gym after work. Like, I I, I basically resumed my regimen for uh, cycling right after that. So that's, I think, what separates a lot of amateur at amateur athletes from pro athletes right is the amount of time they put in right those early morning workouts and the dedication to you know to uh, recovery nutrition yeah. right and it's just not a couple of weeks or a couple of months no it's no. it's what it's a grind right it is and consistency is the key you have to be consistent and and you described it well with your nutrition um, with your sleep, w with um, the time you spend out, you know, doing recreational stuff versus resting. Um, yeah, and, and then the amount of time you spend training and then reevaluating things to see where you can improve. Like, it's really good to reflect every, for me, it was like every three to four weeks to see, okay, what what's working, what's not working? Where am I seeing improvements? What can I change? And I did, I, I, probably still do that even though I really you know I did some competing a couple of years ago now I compete as a master um, oh they let you compete still they, in they certain do. Events? <laughs> <laughs> and these guys some of these masters are really really strong so it's it's something I have to take seriously it's no joke no. and of course they all want to beat me so it makes it even more for oh, me it man. makes it even more fun and special because I thrive on competition. They, they want to be able to say, hey, I ran with a former Olympian, pro exactly. pro professional cyclist, but you Tony gotta, Cruz. You got to be consistent. Right. Um, and then with cycling, you know, when you take a break, you, taking more than like three or four days off, you lose like a week, maybe a week and a half in you terms of back. your training. You fall back that far That's back, how huh? quickly... You lose, you it, lose huh? it, so okay. the maintenance part of it is really important right. as well. And the discipline, man. Yeah. But I think a lot of our, uh, I'm thinking about our high school athletes, you know, who are standout athletes, um, you know, because they all have those dreams of, yeah. you know, either making it uh, to some professional level, right? So I think part of it is they got to have that dream first, right, and picture themselves so that drive and that dream, how do you, are you born with it? It just comes naturally. What do you think? How do you think that comes about? I think a lot of it, it's a combination. I, I think I was born to be an athlete. I really do. 
um, because I always saw myself as a professional tennis player, as a, you know, uh, in, in uh, distance running. And then I ended up choosing cycling, but mm -hmm. I always saw myself being, you know, one of the world's best at those sports and, um, and probably others, you know, if, that if I had played them, um, and so I think too, like one of the, one of the biggest things I could, or sort of, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, recommendations I can give for, for really any athlete, but especially at the high school level or age, there's different paths for every athlete and you have to understand who you are as an athlete and be realistic with yourself in terms of the path and the goal that you have set. And the way you reach that goal is by setting all the milestones from where you're at currently to what the goal is. And you can set multiple goals along the way, but making sure to have those milestones is so important. And the reason I say that is because I didn't turn pro until I was 29. Mm. And when I got to Europe to compete, and I competed for 10 years in Europe, I had guys that were turning pro at 19, 20, 21. They were coming up to me saying, hey, they have your date of birth wrong. It says you're 29, but you're, you're a, they call you a neo pro. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, that's, that's, that's me. You. It's correct. And they didn't know what to say. They're like, well, you're too old. Why are you here? But I wasn't. I just had a different path. path. Okay. And so, you know, guys that want to play basketball, for instance, and I, I reference basketball because our youngest son is a basketball player mm -hmm. who's now a surfer. Mm -hmm. He uh, he wanted to take the traditional route, you know, be a good high school player, get recruited by a college, and then go into the NBA. And I said to him, Mijo, let's, I love the enthusiasm. I like the focus, but we have to be realistic. Mm -hmm. You might play City College and then transfer to a big, you know, university, and you might not get a scholarship. Mm-hmm but I see the potential in you and the drive. And that's like the most important thing. And then from there, you might play at a big school, but you might end up playing for a team in Europe, mm -hmm. which is good. Because one of the things that I did for myself in cycling, and I, it was right around the age of 16, 17, I stopped racing in my age category and I wanted to race with the pros because I knew sooner than later, I was gonna be playing or riding with these guys. So I may as well, you know, get ahead of everybody else and that way, when I went back to racing in my age category, it was hard to beat me because I was racing with men. I wasn't messing around anymore. So I, I tried to, you know, I tried to instill this into my, my, my kids are all athletes to show them like, you have to be realistic with your path. I know your family's gonna want you to do something, you know, that um, they've kind of planned out for you or your friends but there's different approaches, there's different ways of getting there. The point is just not to lose sight and stay hungry, stay focused, and be able to adapt. There's injuries, there's burnout, there's a lot of different things that come into play, but if you're serious about getting there, you have to be adaptable, and you have to be, you have to be able to be humble sometimes and take you know, the path that's maybe not as uh, you know, popular or as, um, you know, a revered you know sometimes it's you, you do have to start all over which i did you know at after six years of racing and but i stuck with it and two years after that i was state champion the year after that national champion and and it worked so all those all those disciplines all that discipline and experience um which i feel students or athletes who play any type of sport at a high level right always transfer over to other things yes. especially in life right so um your kids uh anyone who's ever played some type of sport somehow apply those skills right uh that work ethic um i'm assuming that also happened for you as well right yeah really there's a direct correlation between um the work ethic and then the the discipline and also the discipline in terms of like your training regimen, it, it, there's a direct correlation between, you know, work that you can use that same sort of hunger and structure that you have to get your work done or your studies done um, and achieve, you know, 
milestones or goals um, in school and in work as well. Like, there's no reason to stop. You can keep going. It's just a, a different focus. And there it is. And my goal, hopefully, here at Mesa's, is to inspire the next Tony Cruz or the next <laughs> Antonia Cruz, right? I know you're out there, um, you know, especially during the pandemic. We, we, you know, you saw a lot of people out there. Uh, bikes were hard to come by, I think. I remember, you know, yeah. hearing that uh, bike shops were always busy. Uh, you saw a lot more, more people out there. So if you like cycling, I mean, if you, you like riding and just getting out there, right? It's just, it's just one of the best things to be able to go to the beach, yep. right? Or the riverbed, and you could end up at the beach, yeah. right? Long Beach. It's a, it's a great way to, to get out and, you know, have fun with friends, um, explore. Well, that was one of the things that I realized. The, the bike gave me an opportunity to sort of gain my independence at an early age get out and explore and see what was out there you know where a lot of my friends weren't doing that they didn't do that until high school and by the time i got to high school i'd probably ridden just about every stretch of road in the region mm -hmm. you know and then also in other states um and even parts of canada i did some racing down in baja so the bike really was a pathway for exploration and independence right. for me at an early age so locally to like worldwide look at that that's Isn't right. that amazing <laughs> right it's true and you don't need a you don't need a license just a helmet right just, just the helmet make sure you yeah stay it's safe. important to wear helmet gloves too because oh man there's nothing worse than crashing and cutting your hand and then you don't realize till your hands cut like okay i gotta write I gotta, you know, use tools to oh, drive, yeah. and it's like, and man. it's it doesn't heal as fast, right? No. Yeah, especially when you have to use your hands yeah, a lot. That's true. So I want to I want to end with how we met. Um, so <laughs> this I, I say it's an embarrassing um, <laughs> situation with my tire getting a flat. We were riding in uh, the city of LA for a special event, and Tony immediately just grabs my bike and starts working on the tire right and i just felt like what well, okay well if he offered I'll, I'll i'll just you know sit by and watch the pro do it right i was i was like looking forward to see how you were gonna like fix it real quick but um at the same time while i was sitting there man i can't tell you how humbled i was that you professional athlete olympian um hometown hero i honestly think you are a hidden gem in our community of hunting a park southgate southeast this is considered the, the southeast, southeast yeah. los angeles area right Thank and you. hopefully we can make you um you know uh an ambassador for cycling in this corner of los angeles I would and love that. And hopefully one day I can repay the favor. I'm pretty sure I won't do it. Won't be a good uh, <laughs> tire fixer. But if you ever need somebody for one of your events, I'm putting it out there. One of your events, you need somebody to do, I don't know, traffic detail or put out some cones. You got nah, me, man. I, I mean, the way I saw it was, you know, I was a guest with, you know, you and, and a lot of the other um, LAUSD staff. So I just figured, okay, you know, he's he's with his people. I'm gonna help them. We're gonna get out of here because I have that experience. I'm honestly not the best mechanic, but I've changed a lot of tires. I bet. And so I thought, you know, we, we're we're in a group ride. People want to move. Let me help out here. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I I don't mind that at all. And it's been done for me, so I'm just returning. I'll the be favor. sure to return the favor too. This so <laughs> pass it on, right? There you go. All right, man. Well, thank you again, Tony. This was awesome that you came to our our uh, campus uh hopefully we can keep doing some things you know in terms of bike riding or bike club yeah or maybe um, even uh something around just you know how to get started and some basic training tips and mm -hmm. things like that I'd, I'd love that wow and have you out here riding again with us okay for sure all right well thanks again and that's it everybody uh thank you jesus <laughs> he's calling back that's there. cool what i tell you about that guy <laughs> all right jesus i think we can cut it right there all right he's my he's you he, i got a funny story about him <laughs> he's been with me since sixth grade right jesus and how did you even fall into my lap man you know what I guess this is dios gives right Diosito gives it to you yep. you see all this equipment we have a bunch of speakers that we're going to set up for graduation on the field spread out dude i was like hey we need to buy all you know we need this this and that all right he gave me a wish list put together all this equipment, right, Jesus? We had never done this before. 
and it's just me and him. And this one, he was a sixth grader. And we're daisy chaining speakers. One, two, three, six on this side, six on that side. Crossing our fingers. <laughs> we yeah, had never blows. done that. Right? Nothing <laughs> like making sure. That, oh, one did blow, right? One speaker did blow. <laughs> right? And he's telling me, he's like, oh, I don't like the way this sounds. This, is, this doesn't sound right. And thankfully, you know, I trust his judgment. Um, right? And he's been, he's been with me since eighth grade. That's I'll be great. damned. If he doesn't make a career out of this, I'm going to be mad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's nice to see all the equipment and right. It's this is high tech stuff. This isn't oh, easy man. stuff. 